Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Do you want to introduce yourself? And um, my name is Yuki. Um, I have twin boys uh, who are three and ten months old, um, and they are both diagnosed with autism when they are almost three, so about a year ago, and. They are, they have different problems. Like, uh, they both have problem falling asleep. So I started give them the melatonin. Can you speak up? Yes, they can't hear you. Can you speak up a bit, Yuki? Okay. <laughs> um, so they both had problem to fall asleep. Um, so, <laughs> so I gave them melatonin, and it seems work, but. Uh, to fall asleep, but it, it's not working for the staying sleep. And my pediatrician recommended to use uh, fast acting and long last acting, but uh, the problem is they cannot swallow the pill and they cannot use the long lasting. Melatonin. Long lasting, so I think yeah. what you mean is the time release yes, or the extended time, release. Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah, so let's let's talk, let's go back to the melatonin and later, but let's talk a little bit about your responses um, on the family inventory of sleep habits. So I'm gonna go through sort of some of the key ones, not necessarily everyone, and, and kind of put this together for you. So the first is, my child gets exercise during the day. You wrote always. Yes. That's terrific. Yeah. Can you give me some examples of some of the things your child does? Um, they're in preschool. And you're gonna talk about both of your children, right? Because yes. they're <laughs> twins, yeah. Yes. yeah. They are both in the preschool. Okay. And uh, rain or shine, they always get the outside time at least one hour every day. So they are always active outside, and on the weekend, I try to bring them at the park, or if it's raining, I, we are living in a condo, but we, uh, I let them running around in the hallway or uh, up and down the stairs, so and they enjoy the active play. Wonderful, so they go to the park every day, even if it's raining, they run around up, up and down the stairs, that's really good. Um, and that's what I do with families is I, I don't stop at the my child gets exercise. I really try to figure out what that exercise is and whether it's, it's, it's giving them what they need. And, and, that, and then the other thing I ask is how do they feel after they exercise? Do they feel kind of, I mean, do they look like they've kind of put themselves out and they're, they're, they're more tired and, and all? Or do they, do they, are they more stimulated after they exercise? Um, it depends on the day, but um, sometimes still excited if they want to go more, but sometimes they are so tired, they just want to be the quiet and sitting down and eat snack. Mm -hmm. Okay, and have you noticed a relationship between exercise and sleep? On days that they get more exercise or less exercise, are they more apt to sleep more or less, or you know, go to bed easier or it's harder? Hard it's hard to tell. Oh, yeah. Okay. Even they take a nap or not doesn't really affect the sleep of the nighttime. So. Right. Not so much if they've napped or not, but if they've exercised vigorously. Yeah. Well, Does they're that? Always getting the same amount. Of okay. Exercise. So they're always getting. Yeah. So which point I'd say that's great keep up the good work, let's move on to the next, you know, the next aspect. But it's great that you do that, that will be good for their overall health as well. Um, and then the other, the next question is um, about naps. My child naps more than one hour during the day sometimes. So tell me a little bit about that and um, the twins. They're in the preschool from nine to two, and our commute is like a 45 minutes bus ride. So they usually fall asleep on the bus, and like even we get home, uh, I move from stroller to the crib, or I try to wake them up. They just doesn't respond well. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep their nap time like uh, maximum an hour, but sometimes they just doesn't respond and just get so cranky and. They have the BI session from four o'clock, so I always make sure waking up them by the four, but by four o'clock. But sometimes 
they sleep an hour, hour and a half. And if they tend to sleep an hour, an hour and a half, how does that affect bedtime? Does that make a difference? A um, little bit later, mm -hmm. but it's not necessary to okay. break it up. That it's not time. that big of a deal. Okay. So um, I think in your case right now, even if they, you, you wrote my, my child naps more than one hour during the day sometimes, as long as it's only on a, an unusual, you know, a, not the norm, and it's not affecting their, their bedtime sleep, we're probably okay there. Um, you know, one, one thing I've sometimes tried for naps when a child really needs a nap and it's going to make a big difference in how they function the rest of the day is to actually try a small dose of melatonin. I know you said they were melatonin resistant, but you could try a small dose of melatonin before the nap. And the beauty of the melatonin is it's short acting, so it won't affect them the rest of the day. So you can try that. Um, and then the other one I wanted to highlight was the... Um, it's, you wrote that you uh, really never uh, use the bedtime bedroom as a timeout, so that's fabulous. So that keep up the good work there, because then we won't have that association. So what I'm doing is I'm also pointing out to the parent what they're doing right, and I think that's really important to not focus on the on the negatives, but all that. There's a lot of really positives here, um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about is. I'm seeing that in the hour before bedtime, my child engages in relaxing activities usually, and in the hour before bedtime, my child engages in exciting or stimulating activities occasionally. So that's really good, that it's more of the case it's, it's the relaxing and less of the case that it's the stimulating. Tell me a little bit, and I appreciate your being honest, tell me about the occasionally um, engaging in exciting and stimulating um, activities and what that looks like. If just one kid is fussy, I can handle. But if both of them get fussy at the same time, I just give them the iPad to calm them down. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Because, yeah, yeah, it's just too it's much. It's too much <laughs> to handle yeah. them both. That makes a lot of sense. Are there um, any activities that you could come up with when one of them is fussy that might calm either the fussy one or the other one, or let's say they're both fussy? Is there anything that they could do to get? How old are they? Did you mention? It's three and ten months. Okay. And yeah. They are not really interactive. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Is there anything they can do on their own that would calm them? Um, that you could give them to do. Um, one kid loves book, mm -hmm. but he loves book too much and he mouthing a lot. Um, I used to give them the book like to to calm them calm him down, but uh, he once actually choked. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> because he can read the page and like put whole thing in his mouth, and he was just literally <gasps> and once that accident incident happened, I didn't give him the book anymore, and <laughs> um, I'm trying to find some substitute, substitute to um, calm him down, but it's, it's not finding yet. So, right, yeah. do you work with a therapist? Um, I mean, do you, do, are they in occupational, occupational yeah. or speech, or? Um, but we don't have the private one, so we can get to see them every, like, three months. Oh, three okay. Months, so. I understand. Because <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, they may have some suggestions. Mm -hmm. The other thing I've seen is some of these cloth books. I mean, I guess he could still put them in his mouth, but if they're big and, mm -hmm. you know, he wouldn't be able to rip the pages yeah, out. We have the cloth okay. books, but he doesn't not. Really He's not really interested yeah. in those. Okay. The other, the other thing would be um, you could look for just a really, one of these big books that's about this size that has like the plastic, you know, that it, it would be indestructible in a way. He couldn't really, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find yeah. plastic books, but um, where can I find it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll help you find it. That would be wonderful. So the idea is we will, we will move on and we won't talk about books, but this is an example of how you want to be individualized 
we found something that her child really likes. At least one of the twins is really into the books. Now it's just tweaking it a little bit because that would be a great thing for that child to work with while you're trying to calm your other twin or whatever. That would be less stimulating. And, and books are interesting because sometimes a child will read the same book every time and it will be calming. Sometimes it will be overstimulating because they'll start doing repetitive behavior with the book. Sometimes a new book will be too stimulating. So you really have to individualize, not just making sure that there's going to be no choking hazard with the book, but the book itself. What about your other twin? What kind of relaxing activities does your other twin like? Um, he has favorite blankie. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps him. But yeah. I, yeah, but not Always. Not always. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like he might like, is the blankie like smooth and soft? Yeah, silky. Silky. Yeah. Okay. So it might help with the other twin to try to find something he can do, you know, that would relax him, that's um, tactile. Yeah. The other twin likes my house gown, my house coat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He hold it and cutting it. Everywhere he goes. Right. When he's really upset, it's not really helpful. <laughs> right. The, the other thing I wanted to make you aware of is the, the sleep tips for children with autism who have limited verbal skills. There's a lot of um, sensory type activities in here. He might enjoy um, wearing um, a weighted blanket or um, some sort of rocking or swinging or something and yeah, you know swinging, but we are living in a condo in a yes. limited space and there is no space to right. get the swing right and, uh, we used to have the uh, jolly jumper right the little ones and he loved that but we cannot <laughs> have the space for the bigger kids swing. Sure, yeah. sure. But the idea is you might, when you do have the time with the OT, and I realize it's not as frequent as you'd like or you, you're able to, but you could ask the person for some activities to calm him. Because it sounds like um, there may be ways to kind of get them both relaxed. And then we could build those into the bedtime routine. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. You're doing a great job with caffeine, never. Um, <laughs> yeah, <a little. laughs> um, and we actually have caffeine sheets that I can, I can give you one to post on ACT that go over the amounts of caffeine because sometimes we don't remember that chocolate milk or coffee, ice cream, or even iced tea, a lot of families don't realize that iced tea has caffeine in it, the tea. Um, so we'll go over that when we talk about that item. Um, and then the other things I'm seeing on here are, are really excellent. I mean, um, it sounds like the room is dimly lit, it's quiet, there's consistency with bedtime. Um, the child usually follows a bedtime routine that lasts 15 to 30 minutes. Let's talk about that for a minute. What does the routine consist of? Um, and you do it together with your twins together? Yes. <laughs> okay. We, I gave them bath from seven until eight o'clock or something like that, because they love bath time. And they get so excited, but by the time the end, they both get relaxed and chilling. So, and after that, um, I put the PJ on and give them night night milk and just put the music on and they know that that's the cue to go to sleep. So they love listening to the music and fall asleep, but <laughs> it's not always, but that usually works. Yeah. But the, um, they hate brushing their teeth because I'm giving them the milk with the honey in it. I usually brush their teeth right before going to sleep and sometimes... Um, <laughs> So that's a challenge. So the, and I know we're, we're overlapping a little with the bedtime routine, but I'm going to do it anyway because I think this is really useful and helpful. So the idea is you give them the honey with the milk because it's soothing and calming, but then because they have to brush their teeth because they've had honey and milk, 
it kind of counteracts it. Can you think of another item, something else that would be calming? It sounds like maybe the music you were saying is calming. Okay, so in this case, if we were putting the bedtime routine together, what I would say is there's nothing wrong with the honey and the milk and the brushing the teeth, but I would probably do that earlier in the bedtime routine to try to get the, um, and that might even be an incentive to get your child getting ready for bed or get the twins ready as they know they're going to have the honey in the milk. But then, but after they brush their teeth, yeah. you want to try to unwind them again. Mm -hmm. You want to try to unwind them. The other thing would be to do the honey in the milk earlier in the day and just take it out of the routine altogether because that I way... The melatonin in the honey milk. Right. And yeah. it seems like that's the great timing to give them the melatonin because after that... Oh, I'm sorry, melatonin. I'm sorry. I thought you said honey. I'm, I'm sorry. Honey and melatonin. Honey and melatonin. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Um, okay. Then what I would do is do that, brush the teeth, but then have plenty of... Give them at least some relaxing activities to kind of counteract the brushing of the teeth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you have to do one thing in order to do another. Um, and then I'm also noticing um, your child watches, your children watch t TV videos or DVDs occasionally or sometimes to help them fall asleep, and they listen to music. So, so tell me about that. Do you think the music is as effective as the videos and the DVDs, or um, music is more effective? Is more effective. Yeah, for Good. Sure. Good. Yeah. Is there a way that you could focus more on the music and less on the TV and videos? Um, but uh, when they are upset, TV is much more effective. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So okay. when they are calm and happy, I just put the music on. Okay. But when they are making fuss and seems like not doesn't want to go to sleep, then I put the videos on. Okay. And tell me about the videos you use. What kinds of videos? Um, Winnie the Pooh. Or <laughs> okay, Winnie the Pooh, right. Okay, and do you find that that sort of calms them and helps yeah. them settle? Okay, and this is a really good, important observation. I mean, you're doing a great job as a parent, by the way. I'm really impressed, um, especially with twins. <laughs> you, you really seem attuned to what your kids need. And it sounds like when they are worked up, they really need that Winnie the Pooh video to bring them down. I'm not arguing with that. I think that's great. The, the thing I would have you think about, or the concept I would have you think about, is whether you could move that earlier in the evening, right? So that then they can um, calm down if they need that, but then you still have some time before bedtime to put the music on or do some other things. And that way, they're not getting the video and the light and everything right before bedtime. You know, so maybe do both. Maybe do the video and then transition into the music. And the video would, would you, you do it in that way so they'd still have some time before bedtime free of the video. And then my other question with the music is do you let the music kind of play until they fall asleep? Or do you turn it off before they go to sleep? Um, I wait until they fall asleep. Okay. Do you ever have problems with them waking up at night and wanting the music? When they wake up middle of the night, they want to play or like twin B, like jumping on his crib. Mm -hmm. Like he's fully awake and just start jumping. And they don't really ask for the music. Sometimes they ask for the video, but mm -hmm. they never really ask for the music. Okay. They are non so yeah. it's hard to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna talk about that after the break is the idea of the night wakings and the music and what you can do and how you can um, maybe potentially even put like a continuous CD player on or something to see if we can keep them asleep. Because sometimes the trick is to keep them asleep because once they wake up, then they, yeah, then, then, then things are out of control. Well, I think you're doing so many things right and hopefully 
coming today, we can you know, give you a few other suggestions that will make a big difference for you. So let's give her a big hand.